So the two pigments that we are mixing today are PB29, which is ultramarine blue, and PY53, which is nickel titanium yellow. So this specific combination of blue and yellow doesn't make a very saturated green, and my plan was to make sort of a misty blue-green, something that would lean closer to blue, and I'm really happy with how the color turned out. You'll see I did make a little bit of adjustments as I went along. Both of these two pigments, the blue and the yellow, both use a one-to-one -one ratio of binder to pigment, so it was pretty easy to figure out how I wanted to mix them together. I knew that I needed equal parts binder and pigment for both of them, so I ended up doing two teaspoons of each and then making a little bit of adjustments later on to add some more blue just to get the color that I wanted. Some really interesting effects that I liked while making this batch of watercolors was seeing how the blue and the yellow kind of naturally separated from one another, which was really what I wanted. That ultramarine blue is a granulating color, so I wanted to see some interesting texture and separation there. You can see how, as I was working the batch longer and longer, the yellow wants to disperse in the pigment right away, and it doesn't take much time for that to be a beautiful, workable color. But the blue, the ultramarine blue, leads a, needs a little bit more work. So you can see that as the color progressed, that blue became more and more prominent in the mix, and it was really exciting to see how that changed and see how that color developed. Just so, so, so much fun. The swatches you're seeing here are for that initial small batch. I wanted to do some test dot cards for this color as well, just to see how the paint would dry on a sheet of watercolor, how it would reactivate um, the size of dot cards and all of that, so I was just testing all of that out. I've already changed and improved the process for how I will be making these dot cards and all of that. This was just a test. This color is nickel titanium yellow. This paint has just had one quick mulling. I really like this cool yellow. It's a bit more opaque. Um, it mixes beautifully with like everything. Also, um, I'm using this glass muller, but I also got this little champagne flute from my local thrift shop. And uh, it has a very flat bottom. I got it for a dollar. <laughs> and you could use this as a muller as well. It just has to have a completely flat glass bottom, something that you can make slightly abrasive via sanding or using some sort of like abrasive powder that you can grind. This one's basically one to one, so equal parts binder and pigment. So I have the container here that I use to dry my paints in, and like I said before, this has holes around the sides to allow for airflow. And it also has this thing that goes over the top. It slides into these little notches here to keep dust out while the paints are drying. My one-to-one -one batches of this size, like when I have one-to-one -one pigment two binder, usually get me about um, six half pans at a time. The batch is done now. Should we do a little bit of testing with it? Yeah. Can I try? I'll be extra, extra careful and gentle. Extra, extra careful and gentle? Yep. I know my colors. Today we are going to be making Ultramarine Rose, which is PR259. It's this pinky purple sort of color that granulates. It's very, very pretty. It has a relatively low tinting strength, but there's something in the softness of it that I really like. As soon as the pigment is mixed with the binder, the color of the paint itself gets much, much darker. 
You'll see that this isn't necessarily true to the shade of watercolor when we swatch that a little bit later, but I find it really interesting the different phases that this particular color goes through in the paint making process and even as it dries in pans. This paint is actually a really easy one to make, and I don't necessarily want to say I forgot about it, but it definitely wasn't top on my list of colors to make for videos, I think because it's not in my main palette. It used to be, but I found that I wasn't using it very often, so I ended up replacing it with something I originally thought I would like better, but then I ended up feeling like I had too many similar colors in my palette of handmade watercolors. I don't have every color that I've made in my palette, just because the palette I have doesn't have enough room for all of them, it's just an 18 well palette. But with the removal of this one, I think I put in like a quinacridone pink as well. But I also had quinacridone red and my warmer red, so I just ended up with too many pinkish ready colors. And I'm kind of missing this one now. And it does fall into a unique place of being a little bit more purple. And of course that granulation quality is very unique. Coming back to this first swatch that we did, after the swatch was completely dry, I tested it. I have a tissue here, but you could also use a clean paper towel or a clean dry cloth. And I was just testing to see if any of that color rubbed off. If it had rubbed off when I did that first test, that would be a sign to me that there was too much pigment and not enough binder. Either that or the pigment had not been completely dispersed within the binder, and I may either need to add more binder or continue to mold the paint for longer. But at this point, there was no rub off, and the swatch itself wasn't shiny, which was telling me that there wasn't necessarily too much binder. Here's a look at a dried pan of this color that I've actually been using recently, which is why you're seeing some lightness around some of those edges. The color does dry a bit matte, but there's kind of this weird combination of matte and shiny to the texture of the paint. And when it rewets, you can see that lighter color again. This is a kind of shameful look at all of the paints I have made so far. Some of these half pans are full, some of them are not, all of these are dry. You can see here what I was saying about that texture with paints that haven't been reactivated recently. It's kind of matte around the outside and shiny towards the center. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but that's what this color does, as well as the ultramarine blue that I have from Earth Pigments. It kind of dries in the same way. Once those pans that I had already started before were topped off, I put the rest into a plastic jar. If when those other pans were dry, they needed more paint, I could top them off again, or this paint will simply go into fresh half pans and I will have more of this color. And we've moved into the actual painting portion. I am painting with my handmade watercolors and I did use the ultramarine rose in this piece, mostly for the background, but also to mix some of the skin tones. When, when this color, because it's a bit purplish, when it's mixed with some yellows, you get these really nice, creamy, milky sort of browns that again are very, very soft. I kind of needed this piece as a sort of a breath of fresh air, which, you know, everything kind of goes in cycles. So I've been in this place before where, like I mentioned recently, I was feeling stuck with art and kind of feeling like I didn't know even how to make anything, which I know is silly because I've been doing this for a while, but I just felt like my brain was sort of starting to see the mistakes in my art better and I didn't know how to improve and how to make art that would satisfy my increased observational skills, which is kind of just how art works. It's a, it's a, it's a fluctuation of being better at observing and then being better at actually applying that observation to painting. So it's a constant cycle, a constant process. And this piece was kind of a, a reminder to me that the growth will keep happening. And this piece feels like a step forward, which I really needed because I feel like I've been taking a lot of steps to the side, maybe even a few steps backward when it comes to actually making art. I was reminded of the kind of art that I actually want to make and the kind of things that I like to create in watercolor pieces like this. I really like to include sort of abstract and surreal elements to my art and getting back to that in this way was just it was really it was exactly what i needed and i'm and i'm super super happy 
that this piece came together the way it did. So the red I'm going to be showing you guys today is PR254, usually sold as Pyrol Red. It's a really nice, relatively transparent, warm red. Here's the container that it comes in from Kramer. I wanted to give you guys a closer look at this pigment here because the composition of this pigment is going to tell us a lot about this paint. It's very fine. It's a very fine powder. It reminds me a little bit of like powdered sugar. And when I start to get to the point where I'm ready to mix it into the binder, you're going to notice that the pigment doesn't want to mix naturally on its own right away. It just kind of sits on top of the binder and you can see it kind of moving around even though I'm trying to mix it. There are other colors that just kind of melt into the binder right away. This is not one of them. You can see when I do my first swatching, I knew the paint wasn't anywhere near ready at this point, but I wanted to show it to you guys. The color is very dull, very grainy, and there's just not a lot of color in the in the solution that we've created so far. Even though the paint on the slab looks very vibrant and very saturated, this pigment is still far from evenly dispersed. So this was a few mullings later. I can't even say how long, maybe 20 minutes or so of mulling. I just continued working with the paint and our second swatch here looks better, right? It's looking much more saturated, more vibrant, less grainy, still a bit streaky, far from perfect, but we're making progress. It's interesting because you might think that I had added more pigment at this stage, but I didn't because the color looks more saturated. It's just that that pigment has a place to go. It's starting to be, just like I've said a billion times, more evenly dispersed within the binder. Moving on to our third swatch, the biggest difference you can see here is in the area where I pulled paint out with a wet clean brush. There's just more color down there as the paint is starting to disperse better when mixed with water. But that same swatch that I just did, you may think that was looking really nice, but after I rub that with a paper towel, there's a lot of pigment left behind, which means that there's still pigment that's not bound in our binder. I think at this point I may have started to add bits of binder. By the time I had gotten to the end and the color was all done and I was adjusting things as I went along, it was 12 parts binder and one part pigment. So there's such a small amount of pigment compared to the amount of binder for this color, but you're still getting a really nice, vibrant, saturated color. It takes a long time to get there, but the result is just really, really beautiful. These two little pans you're seeing here are actually from a previous batch of the color, and they weren't full. They had dried and had room for more paint, but I didn't have any more of this color. Now I do. So I can top these pans off. To wrap up this video, I wanted to show you another reason why I love this color so much and show you how it mixes with a few of my other favorite colors in my handmade palette. 